Hello, Kevin. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Uh, so just before we get started, I'd just like to remind the clients, the consultants, that uh, we do record our consultations. So the format, I think we'll just give me a, like a, a double heads up here. Um, so just a heads up on that. But um, I read a little bit of your form, uh, Sheba. Um, uh, so go ahead and just fill me in, um, you know, what your goals are or any, just any important information that you think I should know about. Um, as you speak, I will be taking my notes. And then after that, we will go from there. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I guess just a background on the dog. Uh, he was born in a puppy mill till and stayed there till he was around four. Mm -hmm. uh, picked up by a rescue agency um, and raised in a foster home for next six or seven months um, and then we just adopted him about a month ago um, and so the foster family didn't do a great job with um, it seems like socialization with humans or dogs um, it seems like he's very uh nervous and anxious around people and dogs um not in like an aggressive way um but if people like go to touch him over his head if he hasn't like touched them uh this is my wife Catherine Hello. um so if people are going over his head to touch him he'll scatter back um dogs he's great with um He's very excited to meet them. Um, he just doesn't, he doesn't understand the proper way to greet them. So like he's gotten better about like, he'll lay down on the ground if he sees a dog um, and like wait for the dog to approach. Mm -hmm. uh, but then once the dog gets close enough, he'll kind of like jump up and run up at the dog and start sniffing. Mm -hmm. So he's not aggressive. He just doesn't know how to properly greet dogs. Um, so a lot of, you know, recall for him, um, obviously we're just kind of going off cuff, trying to teach him various things. And so I, from the human side, kind of having a framework to work in, um, you know, these are the behaviors and these are the actions we need to take to get those. Um, one of the things that he does, uh, we have like a dining room table that currently we're keeping his toys on. Um, and he's, uh, pretty bad at listening, you know, Hey, get off the table or don't even jump on the table. Um, so he's trying to get at those things. And by jump on, we mean, he just, he puts his front paws up there. He doesn't actually get on the table. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure. Okay. But yeah, I think overall it's just like he is stubborn and he's smart so we'll tell him to do something and you can see him like thinking like what's in it for me is it worth it do i listen to you and it would be nice to just have that automatic like yes i will listen to you mm -hmm. versus the do i do i not okay um anything else uh he's uh, kind of just interact with some people. He's developed a little bit of uh, separation anxiety um, as he's gotten more familiar with the space and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so when we leave, he'll whine and bark pretty good. Um, Does he so ever settle? Sorry? Does he ever settle? Does he settle? Uh, eventually he'll settle. But... We don't know how long it takes him to settle when we leave. Um, but like when we come home and stuff, he usually is, you know, just chilling in his crate. It's not like he's been like barking nonstop since we left. I see. Okay. Um. So you leave him crated when you leave, and then he's barking, lying in there. When you come back, he seems pretty calm, correct? Yeah. yeah. Um, have, do, you, um, do you have any neighbors that say something to you or anyone's, you know, no one can? Well, we have neighbors downstairs, but they also have a dog that barks. Um, so if he is barking, I don't know that they would say something because I don't think they would. 
Got they're, they're not really the type of people that would be like, hey, your dog's annoying us. I see, I see. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, maybe see, ask them like, hey, you know, uh, oh, wait, what's your dog's name? Ronin. Ronin. R-O-N-I-N. Yeah, I remember from the, I remember the form. Yeah. So if, uh, like, you know, how long is Ronin? When does he settle? Um, just so you can keep tabs on this so you can see if it's getting worse every day or is it getting, you know, may, it might be getting better, right? Maybe, mm -hmm. um, you know, just to see what, you know, how he is because, you know, uh, staying stuck with, you know, in, with the separation anxiety as you leave um, can kind of be, uh, well, it is unhealthy mentally for dogs. So um, it's just a lot of stress on them. So just keep, I would, I would, you know, personal preference here, but, you know, I would just be curious and be like, hey, you know, just, uh, you know, how long is he embarking for? You know, is this every day? You can just kind of ask some questions there. Um, but that's kind of good that they're, uh, they seem like, you know, they probably are like an understanding neighbor if they have also the same issues. So that's pretty cool. Um, cool. Anything else I should know about Ronin or any other goals you have with them? I think the last goal is um, he's very protective of his space. So like if someone new is coming into the house, he will, uh, bark at them pretty good um and like kind of a different a different bark than just like oh there's something outside like he does get a lot more intense i still wouldn't call it like aggressive but like standoffish and territorial and kind of like you know if, if push comes to shove like i'm gonna you know i don't like you in my space mm -hmm. yeah, very defensive yeah um how do you guys handle that if you're having someone over? We've only done it a handful of times. Uh, the first time, we just kind of let, like, we let the people come into the apartment first, and then he came in after them. Um, but, I mean, he still, he was like, nope, this is my space. He immediately got on the couch and just, like, stood there and barked at them. The second time we did, Kevin took him into our bedroom, and we, like, closed the door. And our friend came in and we sat on the couch for a little bit and talked. Uh, and then we let him out of the room and he seemed to take to that a little bit better. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he would at least go up to our friend and like sniff her and take treats from her. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's kind of how we approached it the second time. Okay. And it seemed to work best. Okay. So. Got it. Um... Does he have a bite history at all? No. no nothing. Um, with your first guess, as he was barking, um, or I guess, because you did, you say there's three times. One was they walked in, the second time is he followed in, and the third time was he was in the bedroom, correct? Uh, no. So, first time they walked in first, and then oh. he followed in. And then second time, uh, we put him in the bedroom with Kevin before she even came into the apartment. Mm -hmm. And then she was out here for a little bit with me um, before we let him out. Okay. Like uh, he did, he did bark from the bedroom a little bit. Uh, like he knew someone was here that wasn't usually here. Um, but yeah, once he got out and was able to like sniff her and stuff. He was a little bit better, but still very like if they're if they stay stone, you know, stone still and don't say anything or move, he'll, you know, sniff them and be very cautious around them. But kind of as soon as they move or like say anything, um, he'll start barking and kind of getting defensive. Okay. Um and then how about on walks? Is he the same way with people on walks? Does he like, you know, does he bark at people or he kind of just ignores them? He's he's gotten better with people. He used to bark at them. Um, but now, especially if there's another dog involved, um, he'll let people he still doesn't let them pet him and he's still pretty skittish, but he at least, you know, ignores them for the most part or will like sniff them and like show interest. Got it. Okay. But he doesn't like bark or lunge at them. Okay. Um, how about like bikers, joggers, skateboards, anything like that? Is he are those triggers for him? No. 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 He sh he He's... shows interest, but he doesn't go after them. Yeah. Okay. There's curiosity of just like, who are you and what are you doing? But... And he's interacted with like a small, like a four year old 
child before uh who had no fear and no boundaries because she lived with like a she lives with like a giant mastiff mm -hmm. uh, and so she was just like i'm gonna chase you i'm gonna play you. i'm gonna try to you know touch you and i mean he did fine like he didn't let her mm -hmm. but he didn't bark he didn't growl lunge at her he just kind of like would shy away from her got it okay yeah. um all right so um so no bite history um everything you're doing is technically you know there's really no wrong answers in dog training it's basically like whatever works for you and whatever makes you happy right mm -hmm. um, so we are able to tackle that guest entering the home without having to put him in the bedroom and without having to take him out and have this person walk in first we can get it done like our way um, but then again if you're like i prefer if you just put him in the room let him for the last five minutes he comes out he's good and we're good right but the only issue is that because what we're dealing with is like a nervous territorial dog okay so nervous energy is basically what you're seeing from ronan in the home where if everything is consistent and the same he's cool the moment something changes or is abrupt um he's not cool with it because there's one no warning there's no heads up to him so he he's he's thrown off with it right dogs are, are uh picture image based animals right so if the picture looks a certain way for a long time it's cool once the picture changes they get triggered uh, so that's why I asked how he was on walks too, because sometimes nervous dogs are also reacting on walks where let's say we're walking and someone says, oh, cute dog. They might make him bark at that person, right? Uh, so it sounds like his nervous energy is mostly just carried into the home pair with that territorial, right? Because I don't think, I mean, he seems nervous when, or not nervous, but more like iffy and insecure when he's being confronted by someone, which is like, I mean, that's not the worst thing, right? Um, it's better than him having him bark at everyone. And like, that's good. You guys have seen progress with that. So that's, that's good to hear. Um, but then it's just like that, you know, because it can, can it can look uh, intimidating to someone if they're entering your home and then he starts to be, you know, trigger or maybe he's just like watching the person very closely. Someone can feel uncomfortable. So all we need to do in that situation is just let him know that, you know, because he, he'll never... He, we can't right now tell him that, hey, Susan is going to come over at 3 p.m. and she's going to bring three of our friends, right? He doesn't, he, we can't communicate that to him. So when something like that happens abruptly, it's going to put him in this state of mind. Uh, so our job would be then to kind of let him know and kind of tell him that, hey, buddy, you know, this person is here. I know you are concerned about it, but you need to mind your own business and do something else elsewhere, right? So that's what we need to do to tell him, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, but it's more of just like communicating to him um, in his language, right, um, of of what to ignore and what to like pay, pay no attention to, right. Um, for, what else did you say? As for the socialization, the socialization of dogs, it's pretty good. He's social with dogs. You know, usually it's like the other way around where she was love humans and are not social with dogs. Uh, or it's both, right? It's um, it's pretty rare you get a social a social Shiba with other dogs, um, so that's good to hear <clears throat> that he's he's cool with dogs. Um, what else? There's something else I can't read my handwriting. Oh, counter surfing. Yep. Um, so rules, boundaries, structures, and all these things. Uh, when it comes to Shibas, they're very unique breed. Um, very similar to like the Akita and kind of like the Husky. They're very, um, they're the most, um, they're the farthest thing from a dog, right? They're very primal animals, right? They're very much like a fox, like a coyote type thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, so when it comes to training them, um, you do get, you can get a little bit of like, uh, what's the word? Um, like, I don't want to do it, or you can't make me do it, right? Because they want to do their own thing, right? So mm -hmm. we have we have a history of training Shibas, we have a history of training Akitas, and as well as Huskies. So we're familiar with the breed. Uh, we know they can get really vocal, and they can get a little like spazzy and stuff like that. So it's just we're already dealing with a nervous um, 
He's four, right? Four. Noted. Off. 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 Uh, he just turned, he's like a year and a month. Oh, he's just, he's one. Yeah. Oh, I don't know why we're four years old. Okay. Um, so that's just another heads up. Has has Ronan um had has Ronan had any um or how do I say it? currently on your walks? How how do you walk Ronan? Like is, it, is he on a flat collar, harness, prong collar? Uh, he's on a harness okay. usually. Uh, front clip. Okay. Um, occasionally we'll do a harness back clip. Okay. Um, and sometimes if I for me anyway, if I don't anticipate really like running into a lot of people or, you know, running into stuff that would make him bolt or really tug, then I'll just clip it to his collar. Okay. Um, when you yeah, bolt collar. and stuff like that, or is, is it more of just like a, he just wants to say hi in interest or how does that look? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I've never, I've never seen him bolt out of fear on a walk. Um, I know okay. it's a Say that again. Both what? Out of fear. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Um, I know it's a possibility. Uh-uh. Um, but it's normally like he'll see something that interests him. And, you know, whether it be a squirrel or a rabbit or... Uh, off. Hey. Off. He usually just, like, looks over at us and is like, mm, okay. I see. Okay. Um... But yeah, it's usually more like if he sees something and it's not even when he sees it, like he wants to go towards it. It's if I try to pull him away that he starts like either backing out or kind of, you know, like squirreling around a little bit. Okay, so he sees something. You start to pull him away. And there, are you saying like he gets more agitated? Technically? Are you saying he gets more agitated? Okay, I see. Yeah. Okay, um, so we prefer to not use harnesses and uh, for like most of these reasons, sometimes flat collars because, well, at this time, flat collar would also be the same thing. Um, these tools provide what's called opposition reflex, okay? So even though you see like the front clip harness and it's supposed to be like a no pull harness, that's what it's also called. Um, it's an oxymoron. Harness harnesses are meant to pull, right? Huskies wear them, horses wear them. We we put them on protection dogs as well to create frustration and aggression. Um, when a, a dog is getting pulled back, it is um, activating opposition reflex, right? So when you pull back, they want to go forward even more, okay? Yeah. Now, depending how frustrated the dog is, it can create uh, more like visible frustration. We're like, oh, we're, we're you know we're pulling him away, it's making it worse. So it's very similar to like um, either um, maybe you've seen it in person or like in the movies where like there's these two guys in a bar, they're getting into it, and then maybe one buddy uh, gets held back by his other buddies, and that guy who's getting held back gets more vocal and more intense. It's the mm -hmm. same here. Uh, we have a client currently, a daycare client. They might be doing training, um, but his dog is a Basenji, very similar breed, yeah. um, and he's ex he's really excited to come into daycare. So they bring him, and he's so excited, but he's pulling, and the owner is pulling him back with the flat collar, and that excitement and the like, I mean, the happy excitement, right, then turns into frustration. Yeah, getting held back and he wants to go and you can literally see the frustration start to build you'll see his hackles go up but there's nothing like around like he's just so like frustrated and he's he, the energy and the frustration needs to come out somehow right so that's parking uh, what he decides to do is to redirect on the owner so he'll bite the owner's leg right because it's, it's he needs to let it out somehow dogs are very mouth-based animals uh, they drool, they pan, they bite, they chew, they lip lick, they do the yawn, these things, right? Um, once he's inside, he's cool, right? But he's just making the dog more frustrated when he holds him back like this, right? So that's why we try to avoid harnesses because once he's locked into something and you try to pull him away, 
it's almost like you're just like annoying him, right? So he's going to get more edgy because he's like, I want to go there. You're pulling me back and it's making me want to go forward even more. So then there's like a, a, fr a frustrated dog now. Um, same thing with like, um, it's happened before where like, let's say someone has a social dog and their dog sees another dog and the dog is wants to go say hi to the dog and they start pulling and they're dragging the owner and the dog's getting really excited. Sometimes if that social dog gets to the other dog, the social dog that's pulling will then just quit, do a quick bite. Mm -hmm. They're just so frustrated when they get there, boom, they had to let it out and then they play, right? So that's why it's like, you know, my dog's friendly at dog parks, all these things, but then, you know, when we try to say hi, it's just a fight, right? Because the dog is just so much energy, so pent up. And it needs to just it needs to it needs to come out somehow, right? Um, so that's why we wouldn't want to use these tools, harnesses, and stuff like that, because then it's just going to create more frustration. Especially since we're if we're already seeing it, uh, we'll probably have to like uh, get away from those tools there. Um, any questions so far? Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay. No. Um. So it sounds like again. Uh, nervous dog um we're familiar with the nervous energy we have a dalmatian named kabu um he's the same way <laughs> that's our Coach, that's, that's our... been my best friend for high school for like 10 years oh you yeah. know the dog yeah we know the owners too yeah yeah okay. they're they're some of our best friends we were actually just over at their house on uh on sunday oh nice yeah kabu and leon um you know uh, trained both with us uh, but Kabu's also a nervous dog. I'm not sure if yet. Um, oh, yeah. you know, if, he, if he's being in a social setting and the dog makes like a sudden move, but it could be a playful move, it will cause him to react, right? He'll freak out. Um, so dogs who are more neutral and calm and kind of just like hang out are his perfect or are his type because they're not going to do anything suddenly and it's a more of a calmer setting for him right? so we're familiar with the nervousness we train many nervous dogs and puppies and stuff like that uh so it's nothing new to us um so as for um you know so i'm, I'm pretty sure you're you already know that we train e-collars correct okay yeah. um when it comes to e-collars you know this is a tool that can you know guarantee that off leash recall for you guys um it's the most non-confrontational training tool out there right because um you know let's say ronan is uh, scared of something and he's barking right and here and there you'll get the trainer that puts the prong car on and maybe like corrects the dog right but then you're kind of adding confusion because the dog's like you know because with the prong collar right are you familiar with prong collars mm -hmm. yeah um it's a tool and the leash is connected to it right and if you apply pressure the dog will see that the pressure is coming from you. Okay, so when he's getting corrected, he knows it's coming from you, but now he's getting confused. He's like, I'm terrified for my life of this person. And then you're saying no. And then like, I'm just like, what's going on right here, right? Uh, versus e-collar, um, Ronan will never know you were the one pressing the button, right? Um, mm -hmm. your, our job is to make Ronan think that his actions um, cause e-collar to turn on or turn off. So that he is the one um that is in control of the feeling right um a lot of times when you add confrontation to dog training or you know when you're trying to correct a behavior and being very confrontational about it it can cause conflict right so i'm not sure if you're familiar with season milan but um he does a lot of physicality right where uh you know he does like the poke or like the touch or whatever right um there's like one episode where he did it on a dog who's resource guarding and it was like the, it was like the big dog bite he got and everything it was well viral and everything like that um, but dogs guarding he pokes and the dog bites back because he's like oh who are you to correct me this is my food right yeah. uh, there's conflict right because he was too confrontational with that right so e is great because you kind of avoid all that um, you know the emotional um, part of training the the yelling the you know the, the energy right it can be it can be it can make it very uh, neutral calm and no conflict right mm -hmm. um the e-collar we use uh is doctra uh, as the brand jesse has been used uh, for more than half his career he's tried other brands before but this one has gotten him the best results um waterproof half mile to a mile long range um 
the technology where it comes from, it's very similar to like a mini tens unit. So like a chiropractor and physical therapist, they like use a machine to like massage the muscle and stuff. Yeah. Um, so basically the ECOT is just like a muscle contractor, right? So sometimes people are wondering, like, you know, it's shocking my dog. Um, it's electric, yes, but it's not electricity that's like blowing through the dog's body, right? And like making them stop, right? So um we try to avoid that term shock collar as much as e collar electronic collar or stem. Um what else? Our brand, the dog fur brand we use, has 127 levels of stimulation in increments of one. So one, two, three, four, five, one, three, seven. Okay. You might have heard other brands or seen other brands that maybe have eight levels or something, right? So don't think we have a hundred more levels. Their maximum level eight and our maximum 127 are equal. Okay. Mm -hmm. Same. But we have so many more numbers to be more specific to the dog's personality, the breed situation, everything like that. Because if you, as you can imagine with the eight levels of ECOG, there's big jumps. So yeah. if three, Ronan is blowing you off, but then four, he's yelping, it's too much. Well, then now you're stuck. You yeah. can't, can't, there's no middle. Versus Dogtra, um, 20 is too low, 30 is too high, 25, 24, 23, right? You can always, you can be very specific to the dog's personality and like whatever situation we're in with the dog. Uh, so that's why you like it. Uh, also, the, the way the stimulation is delivered, very dull. There are other brands that have a sharper stimulation or a stim, a stim, not stimulation. Um, so um, the, that duller feeling is more of like a more relaxed communication to the dog. So they're not so like caught off guard by that sharp feeling. Uh, so we like this, how the stims deliver as well when we're training the dogs there. Um, any questions so far about the technology or the e itself? Um, did you touch on recall, like coming when called? Yeah, I mentioned that. Yeah. Okay. So how does the e-collar help reinforce that yeah. behavior? Yeah. Um, so uh, when we teach anything, any new command or behavior, we always pair e-collar with the leash. Okay. So um, we're going to be doing a lot of things to build up to off-leash recall, right? With that, with a lot of a 30-foot long leash, right? Um, because usually when a dog first feels the e-collar, our first response is to get away from it or run away from the feeling because they don't know where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. Um, so we need to teach him that when you feel this, right, it means to come to me or go over there or do something, and that leash is going to be the guide. The e-collar is going to make them move. Okay. Uh, once he realizes that when I'm 30, 40, 50, whatever, how far away from mom or dad, and that thing goes off, it needs to come to you because then the pressure turns off, we're good, we're golden, right? Um, so it's more about teaching him that when this goes off, right, it means to go to you. And that's what, like the long leash is like very um, helpful, right? Once it's consistent, right? And within the program, we do build to like no leash pressure to help him. Which is there in case he does get confused because you know it's still a new thing to him. Um, but we're doing a lot of uh, like pre preparation to build to the off leash with like leashes, long leashes, short leashes, right? Um, so we, with any of the commands, all, all, for all the starting commands um, in the beginning, uh, leashes there for guidance, whether it be sit down, heel, uh, place, all these things. The leash is going to be there um, right away for the for Ronan. Uh, does that make sense? Yes. Cool. The goal would be, you know, he's off leash doing his own thing. You call him, he comes back. No need for the e collar, but the e collar is still on just in case because we can't predict what's going to happen out on this walk or when he's off leash, right? So he's he's doing his own thing, and then maybe um I don't know you're at the dog park or you're near dog park or there's other off leash dogs, and maybe two dogs get into a fight, and Ronan's like, oh. What's going on over there, right? Um, you call him. He's like, eh, I want to really see what's going on. Then you have your e collar to almost like remind him, like, hey, buddy, I called you, and this hits from however far. And he's like, oh shit, I forgot about that. And he should come to you, right? Um, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And then I guess the only other question I have with like the e collar training is, so obviously, like he would associate, you know. I'm doing this behavior, this, I want to say shock, but I know it's not a shock. This mm -hmm. vibrates, I guess. Sure. Um, so like you want him to associate 
that behavior is bad because this is uncomfortable. So, yeah. oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, so when it comes to behaviors, right? So before we dive into your in-home stuff um, and playing with other dogs or any other bad behaviors, um, the first thing what we want to do is introduce the e-collar, right? So it's it's very it's common it's a common thought process where someone thinks e-collar training is when you know you put a dog in a situation where they're gonna bark or become aggressive or whatever, and then you blast them with the e-collar, right? Uh, technically, no, because if we did that, um, the dog's gonna be wondering where did that come from, when is it gonna come back, why did it come, what's going. There's gonna be too many questions for in order. Uh, for the dog to fully understand why it happened at that moment, okay? So before we dive into recall, before we dive into uh, in-home issues and stuff like that, um, the first thing we teach is our heel command, okay? Yeah, it's, that's what I was actually gonna ask about is like, how does how does the e-collar play into heel? And like, if we're on a walk and we see we're coming up on another dog and I want him to heal, how does he not associate other dog with e collar turning on when I'm like I do you see what do you see my like train of thought like I don't want him to associate seeing another dog or seeing a trigger with like negative right yeah uh, we've never seen it happen um, the behavior has to be there right so sometimes clients ask you know my dog loves people but sometimes I need my dog to just walk. Mm -hmm. My dog hate people if I'm correcting my dog for going up to people or other kids or dogs. Um, we've never seen it. I have a pretty cool um, visual on our Instagram. It's called Will My Dog Lose Their Wag? I think they called it. So in the beginning, we're starting a lesson. The, 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 one of the, the mom has not arrived yet. I'm with the dad and the dog, Panda. Um, we're talking a little bit and then mom comes. This is the first lesson. You haven't started anything. Mom comes and the dog is jumping like crazy. He's biting her. He's getting mouthy. And he's a big doodle, right? So he's like really high up there, right? So he's going crazy. Second lesson, right? Because first lesson we covered heel. They practice a week later. I see them again. Second lesson, same thing. Dad and I are talking. Panda is now laying on the ground. And not under a command. He just told us to lay down. The mom comes. He looks up. His tail's wagging. He sits up and then just gets pet by her. Okay, so there's been no use of the econ in that situation. You'll, you'll you'll see in the video. He just learned to chill out. Okay, so he still can be excited, but in a more like controlled way, right? So it's more about just like you know the right place, right time, right? When you're in heel, you're here. Um, if the dog already has human aggression or dog aggression. Right. Then it makes sense if we see something like that, um, because now we're trying to go against the behavior. Right. So if his intention was to harm the dog or harm the person um, and then maybe he bites someone like later. But, you know, we're in training and everything like that. And, you know, it's, it makes sense because that was already a problem. Right. We're trying to address it. So ECOG cannot create new behaviors like that. Right. Um, does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, all we're trying to do, you know, we're not trying to make a robot. We're not trying to make, you know, he's not going to perceive them as negative. All we're trying to do is just let him know, hey, you're in heel. We walk forward when you're on break or you're on okay mode, whatever you want to call it. Um, then you can go ahead and say hi to whoever you want. But right now when you're in heel, you're here. I've never seen, I mean, Jesse has never seen, you know, a dog act you know get frustrated with another dog if they think they're going to get tapped or you know in heel or whatever is like that we've never seen it happen before um, we've never seen personality changes it's more again just more of like a um, controlled that's all we're looking for um does that make sense yeah um so first thing we want to teach is heel um it's the walking command our version of heel is walk with me stay with me and sit when i stop so when you take five steps, Ronan takes five steps, you take 10, he takes 10. When you come to stop, he's to automatically sit with his shoulder parallel to your leg. Loose leash in any environment, that's how strict the heel needs to be. Okay, so there's a few reasons why this is the first thing we teach. The main reason, or the obvious reason, sorry, the obvious reason would be like that controlled, structured walk, 
right? Nice walk. The other other reason why this is important to teach is to get him used to pressure and get him to understand when pressure turns on, where pressure turns off, and letting him know that you are the one in control of pressure, right? The handler is not, it's the dog, okay? Um, so again, he started to realize, oh, when this turns on, I have to do this, and when I'm here next to mom, it turns off. Oh, that's all I have to do, right? So we're giving him like a job and like a how to turn off the e-collar um, so that's not something that's like coming out of nowhere. He knows why it's coming and when it's going to come and stuff like that. Um, the other reason why this is important to teach is to help with your reactivity slash distract, you know, pulling right to other people or dogs. I mean, um, is to the psychology behind the heel is that technically if the heel is so important right and the training is really mad because like heel i can explain is very strict right if he cares about it right technically nothing else should matter because he's more focused here so if he sees a dog right and the dog is like you know uh, like you know like a, uh, uh, across the street and he's pulling and he's getting frustrated it's more of like it's like what are you going to listen to are you going, are you going to be more concerned about something that can't touch you or something that can touch you mm -hmm. right so it's like for humans if like i saw like the scariest ghost but i know that ghost can't touch me versus someone pointing a gun at me like i'm going to be more concerned about the real physical thing not like the thing that can't touch me or do anything to me right so it's about letting him know that you are more important than everything else it's you right because it's easier for dogs to um you know, a lot of times, you know, owners would teach like the look in me command, right? But we don't want the focus, we don't want to shut down everything and focus on you. We would rather him not focus on that one thing and pay attention to anything else. Okay, that's easier for a dog, right? Um, so that's our goal here. And then, you know, the other goal that we're, we're, not, we're not trying to have here is, you know, him to become avoidant of dogs or, oh, hello. Hello, hello. Wait, we're back. Wait, I think we're back. Okay. Can you hear us? Yes, I hear you. Um, so that's pretty much the deal. Again, teaching you how the e works, works, um, getting that walk down, and then helping your reactivity, right? Um, any questions about that? Okay. Um, from there, then we can go ahead and dive into like other commands and then other behavior stuff, right? Uh, so since we're diving into behavior stuff and, and things like that, I'm uh, using the e-collar in there. Um, sometimes when we add a um, structured walk, right? Because usually owners walk the dogs about three times a day, right? Which is like a, most of the dog's day, most of the dog's life, right? So when you add most of their life you know, with rules and structure, they can have effects on other things. So for example, I had a client whose dog would stare at shadows and not break from it and would literally drool and just like watch the shadow, right? So about class three, maybe, um, that behavior went away on its own. I never had to do anything to directly address it. It was an indirect fix. Um, usually dogs who have human reactivity that's the first thing that goes away when we're starting the e obedience, the e-collar with the heel and stuff like that. Uh, so then first it's humans, then it's calm dogs, then it's uh, fast moving objects like runners, joggers, bikes, roller skaters, and then it's reactive dogs. And then the last thing, which is very difficult to address is the surprise, where it's, you turn the corner, there's a dog there. And that's like the hardest part because you can't predict that, right? So that's kind of how the progress works when we're dealing with reactivity and stuff like that, or those who have reactivity. Um, but um, the other thing, you know, that might help as, as we're adding structure is it can help his nervousness, right? Um, so it's almost like, you know, on the walk, we're telling him, don't worry about that. Worry about this. He's like, oh, okay, right? We're, it's almost like we're just shutting down everything and having him just focus on you, right? So he's like, oh. I just gotta walk next to you. I don't need to worry about the dog. I don't need to worry about the people over there. I just gotta walk with you, right? Mm -hmm. um, then when you, you know, usually when we're starting with that, 
when we move on to the in-home, it's a lot easier or it's already starting to dial down. So there's not really much that we, you know, have to address because on it on, you know, as we add structure to a dog's life, they're just gonna become more calmer, right? Um, rules and boundaries, they'll show more respect to you technically, right? So once we start to add word or meaning to specific words, like, you know, um, you know, don't do that behavior, right? It's gonna be like, oh, like they meant it, like don't do this behavior, right? So there's like a certain amount of respect coming out as well from this relationship. Uh, we're trying to build and strengthen use it with use of the e-collar. Um, any other questions? Uh, so e-collar is usually like using from like a classical psychology kind of view, positive punishment. Yes. Um, how do you guys pair positive reinforcement with that kind of stuff? Yeah. Um, so technically positive reinforcement isn't needed. Right, it's more for like if you're refer, you know, we try to pair positive reinforcement with easy tasks. Like maybe it's like a sit or a recall, right? Usually for that first class, we try to avoid it because then it becomes too overwhelming for the dog owner because they have their remote for the first time. They're doing these different exercises and now they got food, right? Uh, so probably first class, depending on what program you're doing, uh, if it's in person. Um, we probably lay, uh, relax with it at the beginning, right? So we'll use verbal and like physical praise first lesson. Uh, but then again, once we move on to like task, like, you know, go to this bed or, you know, there's a person coming in, that's where positive reinforcement is like pretty important there. And it's easy to use, right? Um, so the goal here is just to make things less complicated for you guys. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. Um, any other questions so far? Not so far. Um, some other common questions we get would be, um, you know, is it e-collar on all day? Do we do the program? Does he not need to wear it at all? Or like, how does it work? But basically, when does the e-collar come off, right? The e-collar is on when you need it, okay? So right now, if it's just you two, you two guys at home, no one else coming over, then you don't need it because maybe he is a good boy, right? If you know you're going to have guests come over, then 30 minutes prior, he's collared up, you practice the exercises we're going to be teaching you. And then maybe you find that, you know, just that introduction, that beginning, he's a little, um, you know, you need to use it. But then maybe the rest of the stay of the guests, he's cool. Then you can take it off or you can keep it on just in case because, you know, nervous energy does kick back in. So then you have that in case he does trigger again, right? Um, on walks, it should always be on. Even after you complete the program, it should always be on because again, we can't predict what's going to happen on these walks, right? My dog is now four. I started econ training when she was like six months, seven months ish, um, and I still put it on to this day. And I maybe press that button like three, two times a month, right? So it's on just in case because she still hasn't experienced, you know, a car backfiring right next to her. She still hasn't experienced uh, a firework going off. Um, she's never seen, I mean, she's seen cats, but she's like never really seen like one dart in front of her, right? So I have it on just to prepare for these moments and I have control over my dog, right? Uh, so it's not so much of like you using it, the, you know, in the future a lot. It's more of like just in case it's there, right? Because all the hard work will be done in the beginning, okay? So that we don't need to be using it so much in the future. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what else is there? When it comes to Sheba's and pressure work, right, positive punishment and stuff like that, um, we do tend to get a little bit of vocalization, right, because we're they're, they're very protesty type animals. And, protest is a good word. Yeah. Um, you know, when you when you want to make something happen, you might get like a lot of vocalization, a lot of resistance, right? Um, so things like that will that we'll be seeing is normal from the breed. You know, sometimes we'll get well, sometimes we'll, we like the last Akita we had, because those are more of a very confident, dominant breed, right? They're very confident. Uh, so when you're making them do something, um, you know, they're gonna show some sort of protest right there. But this Akita was fine with everything. You know, he had, you know, you put a muzzle on him, he's good. We just the muscle conditioning, um, e collar pressure, he had no problems with. He was cool with everything. 
Um, I think we have one street, but his name was Ted, like a really, it was a really small street, uh, but he had no problem with the pressure. Uh, we got another street, but his name was Jack. And even with like leash pressure, he was like very skittish, and, like very vocal with it, right? So just pressure in general, this guy was just like not having it, right? Um, Jesse had a client that um, it was a husky, but it was feral until like about a year. So this mm -hmm. dog never had anything on his neck until a year, and then it was then the train was starting that right. Um, so for that specific dog, they had to take a take, they had to take a step back, right? They had to start with just like prong collar first, teaching him that the pressure on the neck and prong collar and stuff like that. Uh, it's because it's a more calmer, or it's more, well, it's less pressure, right? Prong collar. And then they built it to e collar, right? Um, so just like a, you know, I'm pretty sure you're already aware of the breed and everything like that, and you know the, how they are, stuff like that. So just like a heads up there. Uh, so that's why I asked if there was any previous training, because now I know, you know, um, it's just been the harness. So now I know, okay, so and you've used the flat collar before, and we've seen agitation increase. So that's just good to know on our part. Um. What else? Any questions about that stuff? No, you're on it. Um, program or how much does he weigh? How big is he? Uh, he's about <clears throat> excuse me, thirty pounds. Okay. Um, as far as programs, is there one you guys were kind of leaning towards, thinking about, or I can run explain them? Um, just a heads up, it's the daycare and train, board and train, and the in person program. I, I think, think the in person, right? Yeah, we were looking at potentially doing like the nine or twelve week in person. Oh, okay. So uh, okay. It makes the most sense financially for us. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah. I mean, in person is definitely the one we kind of promote. You know, it's good that you know the owner is there and kind of doing the work themselves, right? Because it's all verbal instruction. The trainer mm -hmm. never touches the dog. We're just coaching you guys. Okay. Um. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, we have the three, six, nine, and 12. The nine and the 12 are more, um, gives you a lot of wiggle room. Uh, we can go over a lot of commands with him. And, you know, uh, 12, we guess more for like, if you want completely off leash train, you go hiking and stuff like that, right? So it's all, everything, okay? Um, nine week is more, it's less than that. It's more if like, you just want more station control and that's all. Um, you are more than welcome to start with the nine week if you want. And then maybe if like we're happy with this, you can end it there. Or if you're like, I want to learn more, I want to keep training with him because this is he's learning a lot, right? Then you can buy a three week program, right? Which would make up with 12. Um, so both of those programs are really good. You know, it does give us a lot of time to work with him because we're again, we're going to assume, you know, since Toshiba, we might need some more time and wiggle room with him, right? Um, yeah. so those two programs would be to be uh, would be uh, my preference as well. Uh, to see how he does uh, with the pressure and all this stuff, right? Um, and his nervousness in the home as well. Um, one an hour, once a week. Um, it's getting warmer. I'm not sure how consistent it's going to be, but then we can go ahead and operate, you know, at the parks and stuff like that. Uh, we'll start in the facility um, probably still maybe, and then probably move on to the park as the, the months go by and the days go by. Um, what else about the in-person program? Any questions about the in-person program? I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, I guess one thing you can do, and it's optional, um, to kind of prepare him uh, with e-collar, if you wanted to make it smoother, is you can go ahead and start introducing him to the prong collar, you know? Getting him used to pressure on the neck, so then when we come to ECOT, it's not such a sudden, uh, sudden feeling. Um, if you put the prong collar on him and you realize, oh, like he's very, you know, it's very difficult, then we can go ahead and just cover that during the program, right? Um, usually, you know, she was the prong collars. They tend to be pretty simple, uh, so that's one thing you can do to prepare. Again, it's optional. You can wait till ECOT. Um, it's definitely not needed as well, right? So sometimes, you know, we want, if, you know, introducing the pressure, um, you can you can skip prong collar and go straight to e collar, right? Um, does it help though? Yeah, it kind of helps, uh, but it's not needed. We can still get what we need to get done 
if you don't want to do the prom car, that's totally fine. Okay. Um, but other than that, you know, it sounds like, you know, the Boshiba, nervous uh, with humans and everything like that. We can go ahead and can start building the confidence, everything like that. Everything you're doing right now sounds pretty uh, uh, safe and good. Um, keeping him, letting him chill off for a little bit, then bringing him out to the guests, you know, telling your guests to not really move, you know, don't change something abruptly, feed him, give him treats, and kind of just, you know, another thing I would add is maybe tell them, you're probably already doing it, but, you know, tell them, like, hey, you know, he's nervous. If you stand up to go to the bathroom or if you're going to do something suddenly, let me know so then maybe I can hold his leash or something so that he's not going to just trigger, right, or scare your guests. Um, that we're now familiar with his triggers and what might cause him to react. So that's a good thing. Um, what else? Any other questions about training or anything else? I don't think so. I I mean, I assume the training will essentially bleed over into like we've been talking about you know he gets nervous when his environment changes but i assume the training will bleed over into helping him deal with that and manage it yeah because if when when dogs are having a hard time acclimating to new environments right um let's say i move to um i don't know new york because i know no one in new york is an example right um, I might be a little stressed, a little shy, a little like alone, right? I might be a little nervous, whatever. So if someone familiar arrives in New York, I'm like, oh, this is a friend and I might feel a little better, right? Same thing with dogs, right? If we go to a different environment, but we're still using heel and these command and the e is there, this is something that is familiar to him and he'll realize, okay, different environment, same task, same thing must not okay same thing right uh so we've, we've noticed that dogs who have a hard time acclimating new environments uh, but then you start using e collar and practicing these exercises um they kind of acclimate quicker right because they're realizing oh different place but same task does that make sense is that what you're asking yeah just because like i'm kind of thinking like you know we're not going to be in this apartment forever or like you know we're going to take him when we go visit my parents mm -hmm. um, who you know have two dogs and like you know, new house and, or for him anyway. So it's just something where like, I want him to have the tools and us to have the tools to be able to go into new environments, like whether that is a relative's home or like a patio or, you know, something and not freak out. Yes, correct. Yeah. Um, and then another thing to add would be your separation anxiety. Forgot about that. Um, what I would start doing, even if you don't end up training with us, is for some time throughout the day when you guys are home, if you guys aren't already doing it, like an hour, crate him or kennel him in a different room while you're home. Okay. This is more difficult for a dog to do than you leaving because he's what he's he's what he's thinking is like, you're home. Why am I not with you guys? Right. Uh, so to help your separation anxiety is practice separation while you're home um, to kind of see if, you know, because that that does help, um, you know, when you do leave. Because then if, if he's good when you're home and he's not reacting, the only thing that's changing is you just not being there, uh, which should go more smoothly, right? So you can start with an hour, then you do an hour and a half, then two, then kind of build from there. Because maybe, you, maybe you're like, well, I want to be I want to be able to leave my dog home alone for five hours, for example, right? So then you would build to five hours, and so then the day you do need to leave, it's going to be no issue for him, right? So that's something you guys can do, like you know, today or whenever, um, to kind of begin that having separation anxiety, because separation anxiety is the most difficult thing to fix, because um, it happens when you're not home, right? Um, so that's something you guys can do while you're our home uh, to kind of practice that uh, with him. Um, any other questions? Yeah, nothing jumps to mind. Oh. Um, did you guys mention something about resource guarding or am I just, I think, no, no resource guarding? Not that we've seen. Um, oh. Kind of the same nervousness mm -hmm. around food. Like we'll walk past him and he's like, what are you doing? But it's not like a, 
like I can I can put his food down and like have him like just look at me and pay attention to me and like stick my hand in it whatever and then you know as soon as I say like okay you can take the food he takes it God, and like okay. if I have to go pick it up he's you know he doesn't snap at me or anything okay um yeah just be careful um usually when we feed dogs we try and just like leave them alone to it um because it's a it's a you know technically um you know we try to think what they're thinking you know if a hand's going in their food they're probably like what the hell what's that going on right um but you know um just be careful when you're doing that that's all um and if we do see if you do notice he's like giving like a look or like there's like tension there i probably would just like back off leave it alone because then we don't want to make it like a, a learned behavior or like educate him on even more, right? Um, mm -hmm. When you're doing that, but then other than that, that sounds good. You know, he's able to kind of listen and be obedient while before food, uh, so that's good. Um, anything else you know about Ronan? Anything else you want? Any other questions? Um, he is very smart. He is very food motivated. Um, I think sometimes it does battle with like his stubbornness. Mm. um but i mean he has or at least i've noticed like because we do positive reinforcement on walks with like treats and stuff mm. um i have noticed like if i just say good boy like good boy sometimes he will just like turn around and look at me and like sit and expect a treat because yes. he's gotten like oh when she says good boy that means a treat's coming so yes um that's good. Uh, you have a, a marker, right? You're marking a behavior. So like when he, you know, let's say we're doing e-car stuff and he's walking next to you because maybe he was passing you, but then we fixed it and he came back to you. You would mark good boy and then you can feed or you can just leave it as good boy as that marker there, right? Um, so we'll see how, you know, first lesson goes and bring the food. Um, because it'll help, um, you know, with the pressure and everything for Ronan. Uh, so I, I would say bring food, um, bring something high value. And, you know, are you using as kibble or using treats or what are you using right now? Both. Oh, okay. So yeah, like, we're trying to use kibble kind of as more ordinary things, but like, especially if he's off paying attention to a dog or something, we need something like, hey, we need your attention. We have these salmon treats that he really likes that are the high value stuff. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Um, yeah, no, bring food, bring the treats and everything. Um, cause we're going to assume, you know, since your Shiba pressures and you, all these different things to kind of have more, more positive during that, the balance training we're trying to do here. Right. Um, food in this context, when we're using ECOG will be more of like a reward and not like a bribing or like luring or anything like that. Right. Um, mm -hmm. so that's how food is used when we come, when it comes to e collar, because a lot of times what positive reinforcement is missing is because a lot of positive reinforcement is like do this good do this do this right but what they're missing is don't do that right and that's where they lack at training and why it becomes a little typical because um you know so sometimes dogs get too wired and too overstimulated and they're too pumped right because um they're just feeding 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 they're just so excited right um so they're not able to settle down or they're just overstimulated right so then once we start to add the don't do that now there's the balance and now the dog is more like leveled and not just so like wired for the food and stuff like that. Um, I think it's running, but like, you know, it can happen sometimes with other dogs. Um, what else? Any other questions? I don't think so. Oh, um, you did mention something about his space. Um, is that like, like, has he ever shown like tension or, or, you know, like, you know, uncomfortable vibes with you guys i mean not not now that he's like warmed up to us okay I mean, when we met him when we were still strangers it was a different story but like and you know bringing him home the first week or so was a little like oh okay no. but no i mean no um not outside of play i see okay yeah never nothing anything or never anything that's like concerned us of like you know, why are you acting this way towards us or like why are you you know uh exhibiting this behavior towards us he'll bark at us occasionally when we come home oh okay yeah 
like we came we came home really late the other night and he, he was like what is going on this is not normal like even though we were like it's us like you can tell it's us he was still kind of like nope this is out of the norm what's going on yeah but um, yeah no i mean he's he shares space it's pretty good i you know if he goes in this crate i can pet him in his crate and stuff and okay. hang out with him there he'll get up on the couch with us and you know cuddle okay cool uh that's good um have you guys have any other dogs in the past before i've had a husky before so <laughs> familiar with the when you talked about like the vocalization i was like oh yeah we would have full-blown arguments when i would ask her to do something and she didn't want to do it full-blown two-sided arguments Got it. okay and then um was positive reinforcement your method uh with that with your previous dog as well mostly she was i did take her to like a basic obedience class when i first got her but she was always a very unhusky like husky. Uh, she was very chill. She walked great on a leash. She, up until like I would say the last year of her life, did not care about other dogs. Just, yeah. So I really didn't have to do a lot of training with her. Um, but yeah, if I needed her to really do something, then it would be, hey, here's a treat. You know. Okay. Yeah, just wondering. Um, okay. Um, any other questions? Uh, what would net? I guess the only thing left is like, what would next steps look like? Yeah. Um, so after this consultation, you're going to receive a follow-up email from my assistant Tina. Uh, she handles my calendar when it comes to in-person training. Um, um, she will send you the. Uh, the e collar I recommend. Um, so Doctor has many models, right? So I'll show you the specific model that I recommend for Ronin. Uh, she will also send you a um, the program prices, the nine and twelve. So you can see that again. Uh, she'll also send you a form that needs to be signed and agreed to. Once the form is signed and agreed to, we can go ahead and begin the billing and booking process. We work with your availability, so you'll give us some dates, and then we'll work with that. Um, again, probably first class, first few classes maybe, uh, will be here at our facility. Um, what else? Next steps here. Um, but, you know, if any other questions arise or come up, um, you know, feel free to email me, contact me. Uh, I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Um, on our website, I think our YouTube channel should be on there. Uh, we have a playlist called the highlights. So if you're wanting to kind of get a picture of how the e-collar training works and stuff like that, it's a good, uh, good playlist to watch, kind of get a picture. Um, but other than that, if there's nothing else, it's a pleasure speaking to you. Oh. Did you touch base on his reactivity to stuff while he's at home, outside the home? Uh, no, not as much. Uh, just something to note as well if we could i it sounds like it's something that will get better over time kind of like you were talking about but he is reactive to like noises um so if he'll be in the apartment he'll be chilling here minding his own business if he hears something outside if he thinks he hears something outside if he hears our neighbors like downstairs he will get up and start barking and you know like go to the window and try to see what's going on okay um so just something else that we kind of like to correct i guess um and then how does that translate how does it look outside when you see that or are you saying when he's reacting to things outside and inside when he's in the home yeah when he's in the home when oh. he's in the, yeah when he's in the home like with us just chilling if he hears something outside uh he'll react to it and like bark and you know, get up on the couch and try to see what's what's going on. Okay. Um, yeah, this is, um, um, what did I say? Yes, that's something we can cover. Um, it is like an overtime thing, um, kind of teaching him that these noises, you know, mean nothing to him. 
Um, yeah. this, is, this is again coming from that nervous slash territorial um, behavior he has there. Um, but um, no, yeah, that's something it's, it's, that's pretty simple because then it's just like, it's, at least it's, you know, it's when you're there and stuff like that. Um, because you know the goal here is just to we we can never get rid of the nervousness in Ronan. Okay, um, all we can do is just teach him how to manage it and control it. Okay, mm -hmm. um, not in the way that dogs usually do, right? So, um, it makes sense to him. <laughs> Territorial behavior is uh, a normal thing for dogs, right? Um, however, it just doesn't translate well to the world. So we're just trying to seem like, hey, just, you know, since a little bit of time, you can't. Look at this. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and I don't know that I want him to completely, you know, be like, because like my husky, if someone came into the apartment, she would just be like, oh, hey like whatever so like there is a part of me that's like oh it's actually like good and helpful that you you know recognize hey you're not supposed to be here but it's more just like recognizing when that is you know an actual threat versus okay this is fine so when it comes to nervousness and territorial when they when they when, they, when the combo is there right how nervousness affects a territorial behavior is that the nervousness doesn't allow the brain to settle fully, right? So it's, it's going like a circle, right? Now we're going to chill that nervousness out. But when it comes to barking as in like an alert thing, we, we have two options, right? Usually what we do is depending on the client right now, it sounds like you just want to control it. You don't want to fully eliminate the territorial, right? Because like you said, you know, it's, like, it's a good security. However, I don't need you to bark right at the one thing I already checked out on, right? Right. We'll be learning how to control the barking, but then with the nurses pair with it to kind of, <clears throat> hey, that's enough. I already know what it is. You can settle down, right? Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Um, any other questions? I think so. Um, yeah, just keep an eye out. <clears throat> keep an eye out for that follow-up email. Um, you should be receiving it either tomorrow or the following day. Um, oh, what happened here? Do I still have you guys? Yeah, yep. we're still, well, yeah. Um, Do you hear us? Yes, I hear you, but then we talked uh, Okay. Um, no, it was a pleasure speaking with you guys. Um, and then just keep a look at the follow-up email. Again, if anything else comes up, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, check out the playlist, check out the videos, check out the pictures and stuff like that. And then... We'll be in touch. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks for your time. Thank you so much. Nice to meet you. Good night. Nice to meet you guys as well. Bye. Have a good night. Bye.